I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking today about an analyst's outside in perspective. And I want a quick show of hands. How many of you in the audience engage in an analyst to help you make technology or business decisions? Raise your hands. Okay. And so your companies do. How many of you uniquely or individually have spoken to an analyst as part of that? Okay. So pretty good percentage of folks in the room have spoken with analysts, uh, but a large percentage of you have not. And so we thought that this would be a good opportunity for people who don't normally get an opportunity to talk to analysts to have a, a glimpse into the, what their day looks like, the kinds of problems that people just like you are approaching them with and asking for help on uh, on a daily basis. And so I have a funny slide here. When adopting DevOps, okay, so I just talked through all that. And our big bang plan calls for installing DevOps on Friday and having all the teams ready on Monday. And so I'm sure that they've gotten some calls like that. Can I, how can I be ready on Monday? Um, so we're gonna go through a couple topics. I wanna introduce our uh, panelists today. Um, so Rob Stroud is a principal VP at uh, Forrester. Um, Rob, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for the promotion, Sam. You're welcome. I, yeah. I, I do that for everybody. Um, and Torsten Volk uh, from uh, EMA, Enterprise Management Association, is welcome. Hey. Thank you for joining us. So we're going to talk about a couple of uh, different topics that come up during these analyst inquiries. If there's things that you want to double down on, we have an hour. I made this long. Um, so if there's something that you want us to double down on, raise your hand. I'll see if I can fit you into the conversation. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing is the questions, again, these are questions that they're getting from uh, or that they're gleaning the answers out of all the conversations that they're having with folks just like you. The first question is, is DevOps now mainstream and is DevOps now mainstream everywhere? And so, Torsten, I'm going to kick it over to you first for, <laughs> for an answer on that one. So, so to, uh, it's a pretty broad question, right? Because uh, there's a different uh, interpretation of what DevOps exactly is and how it's implemented in every single organization that we talk to. And my focus specifically is the infrastructure side of things, meaning from bare metal, uh, virtual machines, containers, serverless computing, uh, that whole spectrum, right? And we see a lot of enterprise applications out there, monolithic Java applications, just standard stuff that you have to have. And uh, getting from there to DevOps, it's, it's kind of like an anchor, right? Uh, that's holding you back. You have to find a solution how you create something that becomes more agile. And then you talk to a lot of people and they say, yeah, now we release twice a year. We release once a quarter. We are trying to, but the release takes us three, four months, right? So if a release takes you three, four months and you eat up all of your test resources, a ton of uh, other capacity, then um, there, there's not that much that you can release anymore <laughs> unless you have a gigantic team. So uh, we, we see a lot of this uh, out there and um, this whole cloud native hype uh, that uh, a lot of the vendors are projecting in marketing. We, of course, see that too, but uh, that's, that's more a startup proposition. That's more uh, greenfield deployments. But mostly people come and say, man, containers, should I lift and shift? Should I, what should I do? So I don't want to. Yeah, that's good. Great. Rob, thoughts? Well, you've made my answer easy, so that's good. So uh, we've seen a rapid transition from deploying uh, half yearly, just two years ago, to organizations wanting to deploy quarterly uh, and even monthly. And it's a really interesting transition for all the reasons that you said. Uh, there's a lot of uh, baggage that you've got to bring along. And it's easy with net new. If I'm starting again, I'm building a cloud, I'm building a net new application, it's kind of easy to build it in from the very beginning. And I think here at uh, uh, this event, we've heard from those uh, organizations that are starting net new, right? And building, and even if it's an existing uh, organization, building a piece net new. Yeah. And that's the, the fundamental shift at the moment. So the question was, is it becoming enterprise? So the answer uh, we got in a recent survey we did was that 50% of you all said you were going to implement DevOps this year. Well, right. let's actually, let's, let's yeah. check that. So how many of you would say that we have a DevOps initiative underway to implement DevOps, whatever that means to you, this year? <laughs> yeah, whatever 20, DevOps 2018, is. let's say 2018. Okay, so that seems like maybe more than 
fifty percent. Um, another question. Could if you, you all fill out my survey on the way up, please? <laughs> yeah. And another question, if you'll indulge me, how many of you in the room uh, and keep your hands up? How many of you in the room release uh, at least every six months? Raise your hand. How many of you release at least every month? Raise your hand. How many of you mm. release uh, every week? <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay, so pretty big drop off when you go down from month to, month week. to week. But yeah. from six months down to one month. Oh. How often do you rescue? How often do I rescue? How often do those who only release twice a year rescue? Ah, okay. Good question. That's a release. That's a good, that's a, so how many times is there a failed deployment is what you're saying? It's just a failed deployment. We've got to patch something today. Now fix it. Emergency. Okay. Okay. That's an emergency. So, so can you re-ask that in the form of a question? <laughs> how, many, how many people? Are you? So are you elevating the software more frequently than that? I think he's making a difference between a patch release and a just a release release. Okay. Yeah. Mm. For the firm I work for, we were doing quarterly releases for long, 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 long time. But we're elevating software pretty much every day. I see. Because something's breaking every day. So you're doing deployments more Dial often than a release. Every day, oh, that's right. giving it credit. <laughs> great, great, Thanks. great subtlety. No, it's fantastic. I appreciate you bringing that up. All right, great. That gets back to the, but that's a good point because it gets back to definitions, right? And this is one of the challenges we have in DevOps is the definitions. Definitions right. of terms. What is a release? What is, what is, what constitutes a release? What yeah. doesn't? Uh, I, I like that, that, that point. And that's something we, we've still not worked out. Right. Yeah. I think the exceptions is a big part of it, right? You have your dashboard, your performance metrics, and uh, the groups uh, often say, yeah, this is fine that our, uh, that our code didn't build that much. Our code only built 30% of the time, but it's okay because, right? And then the next group has a because, and then the <laughs> dashboard is no longer a real dashboard anymore. So. Right, right. <laughs> and so now, are, um, in the research that you guys are doing, uh, are there pockets or industries where DevOps is, is taking root more quickly? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> we got to flip a coin for who answers first. Yeah. More quickly, um, we see a lot in, in, in finance, we see a lot, and that's quite interesting because that was also where the cloud initiative started, where you always think finance kind of conservative, right? But when we look at our research, we see a lot of initiatives in that area, and that's maybe because of the automation. Uh, that has to come with it, right? And those guys uh, have that need to get things right or they can absolutely not risk uh, uh, DevOps and daily releases or weekly releases. Uh, that's actually the main outstanding piece. And then maybe retail and manufacturing are kind of the, 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 at the tail of things. In between seems to be random. So your guys' is, is yep. guys data statistically significantly mm -hmm. no, we're, we're, here? No, we're actually pretty much mm -hmm. in sync exactly. Yeah. Well, lovely. It, it, uh, which, is, which is kind of, should good. be the way it is. That is good. Yeah. That's absolutely good. Right, absolutely. So finance, retail, healthcare, were those the mm. three? No, I would have said retail is kind of at the end of the things. End. At the end, yeah. Okay. We have seen, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, we have seen a lot more calls from retail now as they're doing web-based initiatives, more maybe to compete with, you know, uh, that uh, big uh, web company in the sky. Mm. But, uh, uh, you know, I think we... Which one? Yeah, which one's that? But that's kind of over the course of this year. But finance this year has uh, represented a large... Uh, Significant majority of my, my increase. I see. Mm. Yeah, very significant. Yeah, because there's a huge competition between banks, right, and what they offer and how they make their margins. And I mean, a bank is almost a software company more than any, anything else, right? What the apps are offering, because that's the only way to differentiate themselves from other banks. And that's why they need to release so much. Yep. And it doesn't surprise me either that those are all, at least healthcare and finance, are things that are regulated, right? There's a lot of compliance requirements in those two domains. And if you can't repeatedly and auditably uh, do work, then you're going to have trouble when the auditors come around and ask mm. for proof. It's kind of interesting that whole audit 
thing because we talk about separation of duties. Now you've taken us off on this tangent. I'll continue. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and um, it's really interesting. One of the things I spend a lot of time talking to is auditors for, on behalf of a, a regulated industry, sharing with them the fact that separation of duties doesn't necessarily mean that we have two completely different stacks of people mm. doing things. Segregation of duties is proof and evidence that you've, you, you've got you know, the same person that writes the code can't deploy the code willy-nilly. So mm. people say to me, well, we press a, a button somewhere on a release train and it deploys to production. There's no segregation of duties. Well, actually, you can put segregation of duties into that process. And it's mm. interesting that, that re-educating the auditors has been a large part of uh, my last couple of months. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So you're taking calls from not only technology or strategic technology people, but from legal, from CISOs, from... A lot of CISOs, yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of, and a lot of chief compliance officers. That's another one. And, uh, you know, the, we, we, we get calls from chief audit executives as well now. Interesting. And so if there were folks in the audience who were trying to help get their security people sort of over the hump, when you talk with these folks, I'm assuming that you're saying DevOps is good, you should pursue the DevOps. DevOps is awesome. Right. Okay. So you can use the analysts as uh, another weapon in your arsenal to help move the ball forward in your organization. Have them do some of the heavy lifting for you. They have a lot of research from a lot of different reports that prove the value or that prove the, the lack of risk or whatever it is that you're trying Ooh, to prove. Lack of risk, I wouldn't have said, but there's still risk, right? <laughs> Less it, risk. It's how you, how you deal with the risk, I think, is the, the key point. So. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the things you need to do is articulate that good process, right? I mean, you can have separation of duties through automation, but if your automation is not controlled, mm. then you actually have a risk. Right. And that's material mm. risk So at that point. So, yeah. so there's some nuances to it. But. Mm. Yep. And the challenge, I think, is the end-to-end -end aspect of it, the machine-to-machine -machine automation and the human-to-machine automation. So include the entire workflow into the... DevOps process, and that way you capture everything, right? You have a full audit trail of everything that happened, every system that got changed. Treat the systems as code just the same way as you treat the software, and you, you get everything in the, for the audit. Yeah. And that's a huge problem um, uh, in my area, which is a lot infrastructure centric, right? Uh, people slap batches on cloud offerings. Oh, that's HIPAA compliant. That cloud offering is uh, FISMA, whatever. The compliance regulation may be, but uh, the real challenge is to then be ready for proving that that's compliant because you can't just say, oh, dear auditor, you know, go to that URL and watch that logo. You have to actually uh, find a way of uh, showing that it was actually compliant yeah. what you did. You have to evidence conformance. Right. Uh, that's one of the key points, right? You, and as you're designing your, your solution stacks, you need to build in evidence of conformance. Yeah. And, and I, I will, very interestingly, I will tell you as businesses are dependent on technology, we're gonna get more regulation, not less. Regulation is only mm -hmm. gonna increase. So half of our roles are going to be conformance with, with all sorts of regulation. Yeah, interesting policy. All right, very good. So great conversation. Let's move on to our next topic. What practices or technology are you being asked most about? So start. let's start with practices, oh. and let's start with Robert. Practices? Oh. Are, is everybody already doing continuous integration, or are they asking about that? Are they already doing um, continuous delivery, well, or are they asking about that? If I get a call, I mean, right now the focus is on continuous delivery, yep. right? Uh, it's, it's, and it's looking to, to uh, transition continuous delivery across a multitude or an enterprise-wide stack, right? So. We've got two maturity levels that I see. One is the beginner who's saying, what is DevOps and how do I do it? And you've pretty much got a pocket of CI and they're just trying to get out of that. Mm. Then the next level is how do I scale it enterprise wide, mm. which almost totally involves multiple systems. And that's where it becomes a little bit more difficult because they have to integrate release trains and you know, maybe they're practicing scaled agile or less or something like that. And they're trying to synchronize that and then bring in um, the ops function. Mm -hmm. um, I was just sharing before. I mean, one of the interesting trends a few years ago, we talked about no ops. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, th there's actually some interesting technology stacks out there now that are actually doing what we call developer-driven release automation, where actually there is no operations hands-on function. But it kind of differs into, into Tristan's area where he talks a lot about infrastructure as code and and mm. things like that, where, where it actually pre-assumes uh, that. How so, many of you, how many in the audience are no ops? 
<laughs> I hope there's no one. Okay, good. Nobody. All right, good. Okay. Good, good answer. Yeah. Um, we, we need jobs for a bit longer, so don't, <laughs> don't change. Uh, but so if you look at that, continuous delivery becomes something of a focus right now uh, as we, we look to do that integration. In terms of uh, um, you know, tooling around that space, there's a lot of um, questions on every piece of open source under the sun. I can um, articulate most DevOps implementations start with the, uh, open source because you don't have to go to the CFO or procurement to get approval. Mm. You just go and do it and glue it together and ask for forgiveness later. Um, it's, it's kind Look of at this thing I made. <laughs> yeah. And isn't it cool? And it only integrates 42 open source components. And uh, we've actually contributed back to the, uh, yeah, you get the story. Um, <laughs> And, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that's badness, I'm just saying that's representative of that stage of maturity. And then what's changed in the last six months is I'm getting a lot of calls from enterprise architects now saying, the CIO has said we're going DevOps at scale, DevOps enterprise, and we've got 82 tools for everything, and we want to bring it down to a, a, a curated set, or curated sets. They may have something for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to hear that. No. <laughs> So I, I'm hearing too, again, from an infrastructure side, I'm of course hearing containers and the questions about, do containers replace configuration management software? Do I still need Puppet, Chef, Ansible, when I have containers? You know, things like that uh, is, a, is, a, is a big focus. And the anyone, other thing- Anyone in the audience experimenting with containers at all, microservices? Good answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. all right. Yeah. So we have actually, on average, we have almost 70% of enterprises, 500 and above, playing with containers, and yeah. uh, about a quarter of those playing in production, or not playing, but having them in production. Mm -hmm. And um, the container topic for me as an infrastructure heavy guy is, is also key uh, for the second topic that I see a lot, and that's test automation where uh, vendors and, and uh, enterprises are asking about, yeah, what, what are the pain points there, right? And uh, the, the, the common pain points that I'm seeing are uh, that there is just not, it's just not easy enough for external parties to do a quick ad hoc test uh, to, you know, for me to outsource a usability test with realistic data. Uh, it's always a scripted endeavor in the best case. In the worst case, you have to give your own operations team uh, to the to the third party vendor and help them build something otherwise they'll charge you more um, so uh, that's that's why we are see, why we are seeing this right because the more you release the more you should regression and integration and uh, do all of those tests so uh, that's something that has really come up uh, recently a uh, big time but everything is accompanied with uh, with the container questions right oh yeah is testing so. a long pole in the tent for people now is that becoming a problem a long pole in the tent. I'm German. I don't understand that one. Uh, I'm Australian. I don't understand it either. All right. So is that the is that the big rock that people are trying to figure out in their process? Is that the thing that they're trying to optimize the most? What's the what what practice are they trying to optimize? You said test automation was important. Is that more important than deployment automation? Uh, is, it more, is, is there more value there? No, it's a new uh, topic that new came topic. up very recently, okay. quite a lot, right? We were talking about the Tosca and the application patterns thing that was originally made for exactly that, that yeah. didn't fly. And now people are basically asking for Tosca and the Tosca guys must be crying. Mm. <laughs> too early. <laughs> too, early. Right. too early. Too early. <laughs> All right, right on. Yeah, and they're good topics you brought up, containers, I would concur. They're absolutely coming, but mm. test automation, now I know what long pole means. Uh, it's certainly a rock that people are now asking about. Right, yeah, yeah, okay, great. Next topic, how are microservices impacting the roles of dev versus ops? I asked if there were any no ops people in here and there aren't any. Uh, but any how do containers change the nature of Folks who are, how many ops side people are in the audience? Anyone? If you, would, mm, if you have to consider yourself an ops or a dev it's side. 7%. And dev side, how many dev side people are there? Yeah. That's and then the dev of, side, this is the, the ops op side. side. Okay, it's like You're in the wrong side. Bride, swap. groom, whatever, <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, but there were a lot of people who didn't raise their hands. Yeah. So that what has you? me, that has me uh, scratching my head a little bit. Uh, but I guess there are lots of different kinds of DevOps people. Let's just leave it at that. Um, so uh, do you guys see microservices changing? I mean, to, to, to take it back for one second, DevOps is changing not only your organizations, 
It's also changing the analyst organizations, right? Um, when you, as a, as a business leader, as a technology leader, you want to get some information about uh, some DevOps practice, Forrester, they have Rob Stroud who can cover that for you. There are other, you know, Torsten can handle that from an infrastructure perspective. But until recently, you had a, a definite group of dev people and you had a definite group of ops people inside of these analyst communities. And so when you wanted to talk to somebody, you talked with an ops person and they didn't know anything about DevOps, right? So they're going through the same cultural morass that we're mm. all going through right now, trying to figure out how do we mm. best serve our clients? Is that, would that be accurate? You're first, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, we actually just, I mean, we get, we get this request actually from customers quite frequently to separate our research by developers and operations and then compare uh, the pain points, compare the investment priori priorities, compare how they see the world. And what we see is, I mean, I'm by trade a develop development guy as I'm my career developing software, right? And uh, as an analyst, I got more and more into the rigid operators uh, corner and work with those rigid operators in storage and uh, specifically a network and uh, server side where uh, people are that are sweating when they hear uh, uh, now uh, somebody deploys Kubernetes uh, and containers and not even necessarily microservices inside of those containers, but still that scheduler is now the Kubernetes scheduler and who knows how that schedules compared to the VMware DRS scheduler, right? And um, that's one of the biggest uh, pain points. People all of a sudden feel they're responsible for SLAs, but they do not exactly know what's running on their infrastructure <laughs> anymore. So they're responsible for something they can't see. <laughs> and now if you break it down into microservices, those microservices are shared between multiple services or applications. So you can you know, have a translation service and there's nine other things that uh, access that service and you make a change to that and you uh, as, as, um, asynchronously, man, as That's asynchronously yeah. um, uh, release those microservices, right? And they always have to go in line with everything else and as an operator uh, uh, if it gets that fine grained uh, it was hard enough to keep track of the application when they were monolithic and now uh, they are small fragments and they are moving uh, much more easily and they're shared and everything so uh, that is uh, that's the main impact on the operators from from my side well kubernetes can take over the world so it doesn't matter yeah. I mean, exactly it's Just all like that open stack did. yeah yeah it's yeah jeez <laughs> Uh, right. And we, we see that transition happening uh, now where we see uh, um, people talk about containers and Kubernetes. Microservices are really interesting uh, because we see people fundamentally coding, developers coding around microservices with 12-factor app methodologies, right? And uh, managing 12-factor app development, deployment, delivery, and, and uh, you know, is, is actually not easy. And uh, we see a lot of people looking at... Uh, uh, tooling and tool sets to actually help them out and to help manage the deployment and, and management of them. And it's a, it's a very uh, interesting world because at the beginning of this year there's a couple of platforms as a service that people were using. And now we get now where everybody is developing, including vendors who are upstairs, a Kubernetes based orchestration solution set that's going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. So you actually are spoiled for choice right now, but none of the choices you're spoiled for are high in the maturity level yet. Mm. So it's kind of an interesting watch it and see position you're in now. I will mm. share with you the solution stacks you're picking this year will not be the same that you're going to pick in 12 months time. Yeah. You, you, you may still go on the journey with a vendor or a, a, a solution area, but I think you're going to see massive um, uh, ideation on those, those stacks as we get used to Kubernetes. And my mm -hmm. comments on, on leveraging Kubernetes and talking to a lot of people about it is it's actually... Um, it's getting better, but it still needs some work. Mm -hmm. and, and you look at everything that the uh, CNCF are doing uh, in terms of it, and they're building all these add-ons to it, like things like Prometheus for monitoring and mm -hmm. uh, you know, Graphite and things like that. So you end up with this complete uh, open source stack that you actually probably need a third party to, to moderate and manage for you to actually use mm -hmm. it in integrated form. And, and that's, uh, that's one of the things you're going to have to talk to your vendors about and, and, and really investigate what their future direction looks like. And the interesting thing yeah. there is that we have 18, literally 18 categories of vendors, hardware and software vendors. I mean, from hyper-converged uh, infrastructure vendors to 
uh, operating system vendors, uh, 16 other categories of, of IT vendors that all now reposition themselves, uh, as Rob just said, as, uh, mm. <laughs> as uh, Kubernetes, as uh, container management vendors, right? And if you ask some of the, uh, the hyper-converged infrastructure guys, uh, they basically say, what? We, we don't do hyper-converged infrastructure. We are a Kubernetes or container-centric mm. uh, cloud platform uh, that brings you AWS into your data center, right? And um, that's, that's a big thing that we are seeing where customers are just confused about that because at the, at the end of the day, um, there is a lot of bolting on going on, right? A lot of, oh, it's a, of course we support containers, right? The analyst always gets told, yes, we support Kubernetes, yes, we support this, and then you want to see it, and then uh, there is really, there, there's no UI, there's no API, there's a little bit of CLI. And um, at the end of the day, there's a lot of marketing story that uh, a lot of vendors are then catching up on, right, to, to, to get everything done. So there's a lot of uh, complexity in this, uh, in this market that yeah. is generated by marketing. Yeah, yeah. We create a lot of complexity. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> it is, um, there is a natural break right now. Uh, there are other sessions that are going to be starting. This is going for an hour. So if you'd like to stay, we'd love for you to stay. Uh, but you... we do see other people leaving, and I want to make sure people know. Oh, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, yeah. topic, though. We have a natural break now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's fine. Somebody bring me a... Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I need a drink. Um, so, so that's interesting. And so there, we talked about how teams are changing, how the roles are changing, uh, the practices and the different programs that people operate under the, the, the different uh, constructs. How do teams reconcile their investment in ITIL? or COBIT, PMI, there's a conference going on at this, at this yep. hotel right now. I tweeted on that already. Yeah, yeah. I saw that, that's great. Uh, how, does that, how do you reconcile that with the DevOps mindset? With oh DevOps my practice? goodness, this is where I make enemies. Um, I'll tell you right now, ITIL is dead. Uh, it just hasn't worked out to die yet. Um, <laughs> this comes from somebody who was heavily invested in it for over 15 years. Uh, and there is a research program going on now to refresh ITIL, but the challenge and transition of um, uh, uh, frameworks that we have, like Project Management Institute's PMI, uh, you know, their, their, their uh, methodologies, and even ITIL, and even COBIT to some degree, they're all built around structured, frame, structured linear waterfall processes, right? And um, all of them uh, need to fundamentally transition. So what we mm -hmm. see clever people doing is looking at the good bits of um, change management within ITIL, for instance. And uh, actually, it's better to look at uh, um, you know, the service design function in ITIL, far better than change management, and leveraging that in the way you define and build services. That's really cool. You should look at that. But the, you know, the cab meeting's dead. In COBIT, there's you know, 37 processes, and you look at them now, and you say, well, are all those 37 relevant? And uh, <laughs> the, the clear answer of somebody who who is on the uh, uh, board of ISACA owning COBIT, I'll tell you is we need to dramatically review how it, how it is and almost uh, deliver it to you in a format that actually makes sense based on the type of organization you are. And I'm pleased to tell you that work is happening right now. And that, uh, you've got to pick and choose how you do it. So change management, I always tell people, you start with change management. So if you're doing uh, ITIL change management, I'd recommend to people you go and look at what you need from an audit and compliance perspective. You look at where those checkpoints are and you work out how to automate that into your, your tool chain mm. and bring it in that way. And we've actually seen some successes there. Now, if you look at a tool like uh, uh, Sam's tool uh, or, or some of his competitors, because I can't give an opinion <laughs> on any one, uh, you will see that they've written all these really nice integration and handoff points you can go and leverage and use to actually implement in that way. So I encourage you all to look at the pieces you need in your organization and implement them in terms of uh, uh, frameworks and structures and process to deliver the value you want. And, um, you know, uh, you might ask another question in a minute on organizational change, but it has a dramatic impact on, on organizational structure as well. Excellent. Yeah. Torsten, are you seeing a uh, focus not so much in your area of research? Is it ITIL and... ITIL, well... <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a philosophy difference, right? Uh, we, we can't, use, just like a lot of companies use Agile as an excuse to not deliver the features that <laughs> we're learning, right? I mean, uh, you, you get to hear, well, you know, 
the agile development process. Now the release looks different. Sorry that you know features are missing, and uh, it's a little bit the same thing with ITIL and, and with COBED, right? Uh, ITIL is very, very much process focused, obviously, and. We don't want an excuse to uh, all of a sudden uh, not get the quality of the release through there. So a lot of uh, vendors are wondering, and I get this question all the time, right? I mean, we had this question when cloud came, right? Is ITIL still relevant in cloud? Now we have it, is it still relevant in containers? And um, again, I'm not uh, the biggest uh, expert in, in this area, but my answer always is to uh, to basically say, look, uh, you have to automate, right? You have to get rid of silos of individual scripts that are domain specific, that are not parameterized, and you have to make that stuff bubble it to the surface and uh, so that you can uh, run it as one workflow and you can change it. And uh, uh, you know, then you can model it in an ITIL framework or in a COBIT framework as well. So it's, it just can't be an excuse you know, now to say, yeah, it doesn't apply anymore. Let's, let's just do what we like to do. Do what we like to do. I think that sounds good for me. That's a good message. And I'll just make things complicated. So um, hiring. How do teams hire, train, and retain skilled dev? Is that a question that you get? You get people saying, hey, how do I find these people? Right. Obviously, the DevOps Enterprise Summit is a great place to come. Uh, <laughs> if you're looking for a job or if you're looking for someone for a job. Um, but how do people do it? Thorsten, you want to start? Sure. So the ops guys are uh, the most interest, uh, interesting one in that regard because their life changes the most, right? All of a sudden, they get asked to understand application code mm -hmm. and uh, to, how the individual pieces belong together. And then at the same time, the applications get much, much more difficult when they consist of microservices, API gateways, all kinds of moving parts. So the job description for an operator changes tremendously, right? They, they have to be almost uh, developers now. And uh, then we have this other big trend, and that is artificial intelligence, right? I mean, this is, uh, has always been, from, from when I was, uh, had much more hair, one of my favorite uh, topics. <laughs> Uh, and and that's, a, that's a huge trend right now uh, in, in that uh, you, you get asked, right, as, as, as an interviewee, how would you leverage artificial intelligence to yeah. solve this and that problem sustainably, mm. right? Not to write a micro model and to, uh, to, to, to solve a simple thing, but uh, how, what, what job roles would you add to the data center? I get this question from, from mm. journalists uh, 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 because it's a, it's a very uh, cool topic, right? Mm. Uh, where in the data center will I, will I add uh, artificial intelligence-driven capabilities? So uh, those two uh, parts, uh, from, a, from an ops perspective, are, are really significant. And from a dev perspective, it's, uh, from my end, uh, mostly about uh, getting, getting into a paradigm where the dev guys talk to the ops guys, yeah. right? And start shifting left and start defining what needs to go in operations. But that's more Rob's area, I think. So uh, yeah, so we see uh, the notion of what does the team construct look like in DevOps? And uh, uh, I love uh, your comment about, uh, you know, the new ops role is somebody who knows code. And I'm now seeing organizations transition their operations hiring so that if you can't code, you don't get an interview. Hmm. It's kind of basic hmm. requirements now. Hmm. And uh, we're seeing a lot of this large banks, large insurance companies, healthcare and retail, uh, just the last inquiry calls in the last 90 days, I'm now seeing a fundamental transition of job descriptions for operators. Now, they mm. won't necessarily code tomorrow, but they're going to have to code. And they're going to be told they're going to write infrastructure as code. They're not going, they're going to, they're going to effectively form product teams that deploy and develop infrastructure that can be used across the whole life cycle repeatable. You know, we've been talking about, you know, pets versus, uh, you know, cattle for years or any version of that analogy you like. And we're actually yeah. seeing it happen now. It really is happening and it's happening radically. And it ha needs to happen because of microservices as well and, and containers. So if you look at that shift, what we're seeing is this move towards a product team where the uh, focus goes away on individual silos of expertise. So you don't join ops anymore to be uh, in the service desk and do incident management, right? You become part of a, a team that has operational skills that join the product team either, either full time or virtually. So I see this a lot now with product teams where uh, if somebody's going on a net new DevOps initiative, they form a product team, they bring in the DBA, they bring in the security mm. specialist, they bring in the ops specialist, and the ops specialist pretty much stays with the team. 
There's a couple of good use cases developing. They're not speaking here, unfortunately. In the industry right now, the large uh, um, uh, distributor of uh, uh, various forms of food products. And they've got this wonderful team construct now where the ops person is a member of the product team and they live there full time, but they also have a, a, a vertical, uh, they have a dotted line back to the community of ops across the organization. Hmm. And uh, what they do is the community of ops have one day a week where they work on future looking uh, infrastructure as code transitions and changes, the massive project they all get moved uh, hmm. over there for a period of time. And, but they're there working with the team all the time, helping them transition and they're passing skills onto each other. Mm. So the application development team or the product team learn how to actually do things like database configurations, security settings, uh, ops configuration, and the ops people learn coding skills, so on and so forth. And, and with, we're only at the beginning of this change. This, mm. I don't think we've got the final construct yet. No, I don't think we're anywhere close to it, mm. but I think we're seeing a, a real transformation happening in, in teams. And, and by the way, we're getting organizations hire a lot more people with general uh, skills rather than specific. Great example of that is if you go down the road just a few miles to the, all the people in, in Silicon Valley and you look at their hiring techniques now, they're going straight into high schools and identifying top talent. Oh wow. Before, it's almost like a American uh, football or American yeah. sports, uh, or sports now. They're, yeah. high, they're identifying top talent and putting them on contracts. Yeah. Wow. And bringing them, either bringing them in directly immediately and then putting them through college or, or working or, or watching them as they go through college. The, the kids who are best able to adapt yep. and learn, yep. they're going to keep yeah. adapting and keep learning. And mm. that's, you know, and by the way, we're, we're in for a, a career now of continuous learning, continuous changing our roles, yeah. whether we like it or not. That's right. Mm. Yeah. And the interesting thing there is this change to the, oh, what do you call it, a declarative, right? Yep. To the, it has not really happened, at least not based on our not data yet. here, right? Uh, where, uh, there's a lot of uh, companies that say the, the applications, you, whether you deploy them to containers or to serverless or to wherever, it doesn't matter, right? But it actually matters. I mean, it's is there nice. anybody where it doesn't matter where you can just deploy your applications to any target? Is, is there anybody in the audience who can just do that? So today we are doing VMs, tomorrow we're doing containers. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah we are. Yeah. You're using Electric Cloud for that? <laughs> no, we're not. Actually, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yeah. Some great questions from the guy who can deploy anywhere. <laughs> this is like amazing. Um, so I don't know, do one of you guys want to cover the DevOps? I will cover the DevOps question. What do I think DevOps yeah, is? Yeah, you should give us it. Because 90% are wrong, but guess what? If you think you're the one person who's got it right, <laughs> then you're wrong. So eh, I'd throw that out there. Um, in my opinion, it's all about uh, uh, aligning teams and practices to ship software. That's what DevOps is. Uh, and it, you could obviously go a lot more detailed than that. But at the highest level, it's really about just creating that alignment. Yeah. yeah I, and I agree. I mean, you, you talk to Gene or, or uh, the guys that were around in the, you know, eight years or 10 years ago when we started this, uh, that's all it was about. It was about fact we had a problem with agile teams developing faster than ops teams could consume. Mm -hmm. And all, we did, all this conceptually came through is so we could, we could join these teams, fuse these teams together to mm -hmm. deploy in a more rapid and consistent basis with higher velocity and higher quality. And by the way, if we asked everybody in this room, everybody will come up with a different definition of DevOps. I hate to say, yeah. I would love an industry declared at least sentence. That and, would be, and, yeah. I, and, I, and I've changed my industry declared sentence three times in the last year. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm no right. better, by the Continuously way. Continuously improving, yeah. I Most mean, to me, it's the shift left piece, right, where you fail early, you put the operations all the way left in the code so that the developers and the operators work together from the beginning so that the developers have the problem of making sure that their software can be monitored, can be deployed. It's not a horrible monster, right, where I need a runtime that I can't mm. reproduce. 
So people have to be responsible for it, but you can then also not have the, uh, the developers be responsible for the whole thing in the end, uh, because they also, uh, I mean, it, it needs to be a fair uh, and equitable uh, uh, distribution of responsibility from the beginning of that process and uh, the architects uh, on the developer end and the architect on the uh, operations end, they have to talk every day and they have to, you know, when I design my software on the abstract level, whether that goes in a container, or that, and by the way, container to me is a, a Docker container. I mean, it's a, it's something where, uh, where a service can share, where services can share uh, an operating system where they are separated on the same operating system. I mean, it's my, I don't know what you, what you're looking for there. Maybe the mic. Were you looking for a microservices <laughs> definition or a container no. definition? No, it's just a. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so that's where I'm probably going to differ, differ, differ with you because we are actually looking now. Um, CI and CD, if you go to the, the definition of CI, it's really just about the code push. That's it. It ends there. That's the definition as defined. Um, mm. Now, whether I agree with that or not, doesn't matter whether it goes a little bit more to the right, to unit testing. Is it a pull request where CD starts? I don't know, somewhere around there. But as long as you, we all have a definition in our own organization, I'm comfortable with that, right? Um, but you're right, a lot of what we're talking about is the base CI thing, and we actually think effective DevOps starts to your point exactly from CI. The reality of it is that most organizations have actually made a, a CI decision already. They've, they've, uh, most, in fact, it fails at the pull request for most organizations. I see, I see that, and then I see the second big failure is when we deploy to production, no matter what that is, because we still have the ops team sitting here saying, this is our policy, our process, our procedures. We don't care what you say, dev, live with it. Mm -hmm. And that's where this, this friction still, still happens. Sounds like you've solved the problem, but uh, I'll put you over here in the, the ones that we want to use. The magical <laughs> unicorn lady. No, 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 we, yeah. want you, we want you talking about what you've done yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, in this event, because we need more examples <laughs> like that. Uh, I'm honest, mm -hmm. right? We need, yeah. because, there's a real problem with, with that friction at the moment. Yeah, another comment here. So, a, a question. So, CD, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. Yeah. Here's CD, band of the uh, what, Do you guys have a definition? <laughs> and uh, articulate the differences between the delivery and deployment and when you use CD for which one? So, a uh, question was uh, what's the difference between continuous question. delivery and continuous deployment? And what's the definition? Well, uh, it's really interesting. We're, we're struggling with this same definition right now, uh, and this is because we break up. Um, and it was interesting, Tristan talked about comparing dev and ops, right? So I, I pulled some data before coming here just to look at it. And I will tell you that still, dev is uh, faster than ops, like by a big difference. Yeah. Um, two to one is the statistics right now, uh, to give you an idea. So the development idea of CD is different to the ops idea. And uh, so what we're doing now is we're trying to get rid of the, and this is what we're doing at Forrester, and, and it's probably different to some of the industry. We're trying to get rid of the term uh, release automation completely and put it under the CD banner. So you'll go everywhere from a pull request right through the testing cycle to the staging, QA and production, all in one stream. Now, I actually think you can't separate CI from that. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. going to end up with CI, CD. And in fact, my peer at Forrester wants us to actually go away from doing independent CD and CI waves that we do, or those types of reports. And we want us to bring them all together into one, because that's what true DevOps is. It's all together. So CD, delivery, or deployment? Uh, we're calling it deployment now. We, we, we've, we've abandoned delivery is that definition. Interesting. You'll yeah. see that soon, Sam. Great. Not, I've just heard it here. We've heard it here first. This is pretty exciting. Yeah, what I've heard is uh, delivery encompasses CI delivery. Yeah. That's where the industry's at right now. That's fair. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Fantastic conversation. I love the questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
So bonus question, uh, how does DevOps necessitate changes to the organizational structure? And we talked a little bit about the analyst firm, but uh, we can talk about structure inside of companies and at the analyst firm. So Rob, why don't you start? Yeah, I got the hard one, all right? Um, we are definitely seeing um, a flattening of organizations now where um, we are uh, advanced DevOps organizations, and some of them are speaking here, uh, are actually now getting rid of the dev and ops segregation. There's no more a VP of dev and a VP of ops. There's becoming a VP of uh, um, something else. I don't know what that title's gonna be. It's not VP of DevOps, by the way. Mm -hmm. It is some organizations, but we're not seeing that widespread. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not anyway, maybe you are, but I'm not. Um, and we are seeing a, like a removal of a whole tier of management. And then we're seeing a, 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 one of the changes I'm now seeing, and I was actually with a large uh, organization in Europe just a few weeks ago. They have actually got rid of ops and dev completely, and they've now moved all product teams into the lines of business. Mm -hmm. So our ops has actually been, uh, sorry, uh, IT has effectively been uh, removed other than enterprise architecture, security, database, and some other architecture decisions. And the product teams are now going back into the lines of business. Will that become normal? I don't think so, but maybe. But uh, we're starting to see those types of uh, organizations emerge. We're starting to see uh, more and more, um, as I alluded to before, functional silos are disappearing. You don't have a job anymore from an ops perspective, VP problem management, that's gone. VP incident management, gone. You know, those roles are fundamentally disappearing and you're seeing uh, uh, teams transition into these new roles. We are still seeing communities of practice around security. One of the areas that we are seeing um, start to be addressed though, it's scale, DevOps at scale is uh, almost every time we see DevOps at scale, the database gets in the way. Whether it's DB2, Oracle, um, so on and so forth. We're now starting to see forward thinking organizations bring database into the DevOps uh, structure. And that's a relatively new change. Yeah. That is a community of practice, but their job is to actually defer the skills and give the tools to the automated testing stacks. And you were talking about mm. testing before. I think that's the other change we're seeing is uh, testing lives separately in most organizations. We are starting to see that move mm. back into the, uh, mm. uh, the, the end, yeah, end absolutely. chain. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we see this trend, right? There was this trend that's what converged infrastructure. That's, that's why this uh, became so big, the hyper-converged converged piece, because uh, the, the VMware guys wouldn't get from the storage guys the storage fast enough, and the network guys wouldn't zone the network fast enough for that. So they went to new 10, uh, probably shouldn't, uh, to, to, to all of those different... Uh, all of those different vendors, and then started getting their quick, their quick fix, their quick solutions, right? And uh, now we see the same thing uh, with, with DevOps. Uh, there, there were DevOps teams in the beginning. People thought they had to do DevOps teams, but now it's kind of almost an immaturity indicator. It's, it's more uh, now uh, the, the architects talking, it's more like open channels of communication versus a team that has a finite timeline. It's, it's a true change in the organization that they all work together and are responsible for the same uh, a set of uh, metrics in the end, right? And we see uh, acquisitions happening mm. in the big area, like VMware acquiring Wavefront uh, mm. to, to get that aspect, right? To bring Wavefront for the developers' metrics, and then they bring VR ops for the, for the, for the other guys, and now they're converging those two things. So uh, that's a big thing that we're seeing. And I guess the other thing we're seeing too is this, this uh, you know, we talk about DevOps and, you know, I think fundamentally one of the um, areas of uh, comment I have is that uh, DevOps is not driving business transformation. DevOps fuels it. So, right. you know, I think that's the subtle difference. Business or digital transformation is actually a board topic. Yeah. It's a, or a senior management topic. Uh, you know, I hate to say it, DevOps is not necessarily a board topic. Um, you know, we might, we, we had a lot of speeches this morning and said, oh, it's a, it's a glorified high level topic. Well, I can tell you right now, if I walk into a, a board meeting and I'm doing this uh, with a bank right now, where we're going to present DevOps to the board, but we're not going to tell them it's DevOps. Yeah. We're going to tell them it's business transformation and this is how we're going to do it. Right. We won't mention the word DevOps once, but you can back, it's all DevOps underneath. Right on. All right. 
Very good. So um, I'm going to get to your question in just a second. We are done with all the prepared prepared uh, yeah. content. And so at this point, we've got, I think, 10 minutes left. So I'd love to take some questions uh, from the audience. I'll start right over here with you. Sure. So back to the hiring topic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't. Uh, no, I, I think it's a, it's a bigger, it's less addressed than the other way around, right? Yeah. The plan would be to bring your ops people over to join those teams yeah. with the skills and then yeah. cross for each other. So that's what I'm starting to see happen because I think we, we both see this. Exactly what you said. We've gone and worked and we deliver a self-provisioning, self-requested environment. We do what they want and uh, then it doesn't work. So they call us anyway. So, you know, we're starting to see the yeah. ops role go into the product teams, whether it's permanent or, in, you know, just for a period of time, I don't know yet. We'll ask you yeah. next year. Yeah. Yeah, it'll also be interesting. I mean, it's directly related to this abstraction of the application or the services from the underlying infrastructure. Because you guys probably aren't there, most of them, other than him, are, aren't really there. But if you were there, then it would be all cattle, right? And uh, we could just deploy and wouldn't have those issues anymore. So I think it should be hug a server day. <laughs> <laughs> Torsten, yeah. I could be wrong, but it looked like you chuckled before when Robert mentioned infrastructure by code. Uh huh. Was that a chuckle? When was that? About <laughs> 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Can we play the recording back? <laughs> yeah, infrastructure back. And so if there was a chuckle, I'm curious why. And, and if not, then we can move on to the next question. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the infrastructure by code uh, topic for me always is the, uh, the, the uh, it, it's kind of the evolution of scripting, right? It's scripting 2.0. Now you have Puppet Chef, Ansible, all, all of those uh, configuration management tools. and. Um, instead of using what you should be using, which is, uh, you know, the tools that they are building to do it top down yeah. based on the application, you still add more and more and more individual infrastructure as code to it. And you then have to treat it like code. I mean, that's uh, I, maybe I chuckle because so many vendors are spending so much marketing dollars on, on trying to get uh, uh, the end users, you guys, to, 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 to see that that's what you should be doing. But at the end of the day, it's a significant transformation to, it's, it's a totally different way of doing IT, right? And the old IT guys, again, they, they are not, uh, they're not able to do that without significant retraining. I mean, that's, maybe that's why I chuckled. Yeah. <laughs> and containers are going to take it all away anyway, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So they'll solve all the problems and then we're good. So we got a question right here. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, this is about the database. You mentioned database is coming into the DevOps area. Um, I'm seeing in my company, uh, at least, bringing the DevOps practices for continuous deployments. Always there's a problem. There's a disconnect between the application side, the database side. So what, what are the developments in combining those database into these DevOps practices to make it a seamless deployment going forward, just you will share your thoughts. Mm. So database is a real, um, it's a newcomer to this, right? Because if you look at the original um, unicorn apps that we, we, that we, that we, you know, if you were here three years ago, maybe you were, uh, we were talking about these new initiatives, these, these pilots, these prototypes that people were doing, and pretty much they would do self-contained everything end to end. And uh, now we're going, okay, let's do it at scale. So that means we've got a DB2 from mainframe, we've got, or DB2 on distributed, we've got uh, Oracle, right? And uh, if you start, and complex SQL, you know, maybe we're using Progress or Maria or something like that. And uh, if you've got multiple teams working on the same database and, and you're using scaled agile around it, so you've got multiple teams working on the same data source, those database changes conflict. So that's why suddenly enterprise at scale said, hey, stop, 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 stop. We've got to bring database under the same methodology that we have for DevOps. So there's actually a number of tools on the market starting to form, and a couple of them I think are upstairs. But I, we're starting to see that now where the DBAs, as first step, come into the teams to help them out. 
That's the first thing. And we can't keep, DBAs are expensive and hard to get, so we can't bring them in full time. So what we're seeing uh, some organizations do is work with those tools, give the teams the capability to uh, articulate their database changes and then uh, the, the format and schema and data changes and push them up uh, to a set of testing scripts. And that's the other thing we're starting to see. We're starting to see testing expanded to include database now. Uh, we're really early in that. I'm hoping next year there's some sessions here on, on that because how people do it successfully because we've got a couple of lighthouse uh, executions there. But as you scale, and you know, if we see DevOps scale next year, which I hope we do, uh, we're really going to have to need database to, to come to the forefront. So it's really early days. Because I don't know about you, but you can't all go back and rewrite your database schemas. If you do that, it will take forever. So question for you, uh, based on your question, is a great question. Um, can you swap in the word mainframe for database and say most of the same stuff? <laughs> so. True. Yeah, uh, sorry, you can go. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Uh, we've seen, um, and I was going to talk about this tomorrow, I've seen significant increase in mainframe-based increase how to do DevOps in the mainframe. And I mean a uh, really accelerated number of uh, increase, and my whole team has. So we're really seeing that uh, people are trying to start, I mean, they've gone as far as they can with the systems of differentiation, systems of engagement, Worked out we actually need to make some changes on the back end. And uh, you know, there's one organization that's here where their DevOps initiative is stalled on the fact that they can't do DB2 at scale. Mm. And they need to solve that problem before they can move ahead. And the, 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 the commonality between the database and the mainframe there is that you want to get rid of any outlying system that's not part of that standard mm. process to mm. rev whatever version you want to rev uh, for the next thing. Mm. I'm going to get this guy right here, and then I'll come back and I'll I'll let you. Quick question: Can you replace database with Microsoft Windows? Say what? <laughs> Is that a serious question, or are you trying to poke poke Windows? You must Windows? replace database with Microsoft Windows. Oh. Windows supported, more lagging behind. And the most of the enterprise applications are on Windows. So it is a serious question on lack of tools that help us migrate. You know, all these presentations here are cool, nice. I saw one Windows presentation, mm. uh, but as mm. a large enterprise, I think. So, do you know any good tools to help them migrate over to, to Unix, to Linux? Is that uh, <laughs> that's not what you're asking, though, no. is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, sure. Are you aware of the? Oh, okay, so if you look at what Microsoft are doing, um, and this is not a plug for Microsoft, so please forgive me, but Microsoft have decided to um, open source a whole bunch of components around .NET, and uh, uh, they've just, that's recent, right, last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so Microsoft are understand the, the challenges you're talking about, and so they've decided to proactively, and Sam is here from Microsoft somewhere under incognito, if you find him, ask him about it. Sam Guggenheimer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, so and, and, and uh, one of the things they're trying to do is really, st they've acknowledged that they agree, they acknowledge the problem, and they are trying to, to work with the community to get uh, .NET open source so you can actually go and leverage uh, those capabilities far more easily. Mm. So watch this space, it's coming. <laughs> There's a question up there. Okay. So a follow up onto the database question generally. Uh, basically recovering from failed deployments and how do you deal with data at that point? Recovering? Oh, fail forward, fail back, uh, yeah. 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 You, know, you can release really quickly in theory, you should, uh, and this is part of the testing updates that are happening now. So if you look at, uh, I won't say tools names, but if you look at the, the, the uh, uh, tools that are starting to come on the market, um, they are now starting to give you, like you do with a continuous uh, or an ARA tool, uh, where you've got backout scripts and backout capabilities, they're starting to deliver a database backout um, capability as well. Now, if you're doing a, a, a gazillion terabyte Oracle database, that, that's not going to work there, okay? So you, mm. you're probably going to look at a different deployment, uh, you know, mm. a blue-green type deployment there. We've actually got two instances, the, the new data store and the old data store running in parallel for a period of time. That comes back to the deployment expertise, which we can't replace in ops. Mm. That, those skill sets are going to continue because we need to have those skills. Mm. There's also a couple of companies that 
I forget the names legitimately, but they abstract the databases from the underlying servers. Bunch, yep, yep, yep. So, uh, briefed with a bunch of them recently to look at their solutions. I don't know how much that stuff is in use. Um, uh, but uh, it's about old versions of SQL Server of Microsoft yeah. stuff to uh, transfer them over, to migrate them, to make them highly availability so available. So, great. All right, another that. question right here. Um, what are some of the best metrics that you see being used to measure? Are you being successful with DevOps? We see some agile mm. metrics in use a lot, but yeah. the true end-to-end yeah. -end measure. Uh, what are your thoughts? Hmm. You got any? I know there's uh, there's a presentation, uh, I think yeah. next door, and I think tomorrow, uh, yeah. by Anand Dahire uh, from our company with a lot of those <laughs> metrics to take a look at. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, okay. we, we, we see a lot of dashboards, right, where they, uh, some of them from the electric cloud one, right, where they, where they show basically the, the complete, uh, the degree of automation is, is one, one good one, right? Uh, the degree of pipeline automation, uh, looking at the individual parts of it, and uh, how many uh, does the success rate of the automatic builds uh, at every at every evening is something that we always used to use. Um, the, so basically, relatively standard uh, things that show that you've automated the pipeline that you're deployment. Yeah. See how many deployments, how fast Mm, yeah, that's true. And by the way, you, you've articulated, uh, uh, we call that area value stream mapping right now, or value stream management and or value stream measurement. And it's an area we're doing significant research on right now because mm. we're actually s agree with you. We're seeing people say, okay, I've got a piece of ideation sitting over here in backlog, right? And I want to know number of, I do want to know deployment, deployment dates. I do want to know that. But I do want to know the full life cycle cost of deployment. True, end to end. Yeah, I want to know that too. But I actually want to know if I'm delivering any business value well, out of yeah. that. Yeah. And that's that's kind of where we're getting to now, maturity level two and three and four, as you go through the chain. So there's a you know once again, uh, if you go upstairs uh, and uh, talk to the vendor community, maybe even including the the group that Sam works for and others, um, they are now all talking about those types of things. And there's, a, there's one vendor up there, I won't name them right now, who actually um, gives a methodology for, for that mm. type of measurement end-to-end -end and, and a business value management type thing. One of the things I love, by the way, and I really want to measure, is I want to measure what the business give me in terms of ideation or, or backlog and user stories. I want to measure if they really drive business value. Mm. Mm. And I want to go back to them and say, you had me spend three weeks on this, <laughs> it delivered zero business value. Yeah. Yeah. You're accountable for that and, investment, not me. And that's quite interesting. There's a couple of vendors uh, that do traditional operations infrastructure management, infrastructure operations management, that actually exactly feed this data back into the process, right? Where they say, oh, yeah, this new feature that got pushed out during that release, it's hardly ever used. Mm -hmm. So there's a problem with it, but don't worry about it so much, right? Versus other features. Um, so th that's an interesting piece uh, to the story from connecting dev to, to ops. All right, we have time for one last question. One final good question. One final question, here we go. <laughs> so as you were speaking about the database conundrum, it reminded me of the strategic business unit split in the 90s when we were carving out IT to make strategic business units. So you know what I speak of. I lived in it. This all seems very similar to me. And it seems like we're headed for a lot of the same roadblocks that made that not possible. We're trying to push through those with automation. Then it seems like maybe that's the differentiator with this round of decentralization, but it seems awfully familiar territory to me. I wondered what your perspective uh, on that was. Uh, Thank you. So uh, like you, I've been around long enough to... Watch it now. All right. <laughs> Unlike you, I've been around <laughs> long enough <laughs> um, I mean, I started a mainframe main, when mainframe was a mainframe, right? And uh, it was the, the option. And thankfully, I've lived through some evolutions. I've been very happy to live through it. I mean, this, this latest one is the most exciting one that I've lived through so far. And uh, I think this time, what's driving this is not IT, but it's business transformation. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the glue that I hope that pins this together. Mm. But at the end of the day, um, things are cyclic. 
So even if we, when we're finished this transition, I bet some of you are here, not me, in 10 years time, talking about the next one. <laughs> and, what it, and you'll say, and, and I'll be at the back with my, my, my cane or walker saying, I lived this 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Right. And the reality is, the more things change, the more they stay the same. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be enjoying that money retired. The pendulum. Mm -hmm. we'll That's my back. plan anyway. All right, great well, comment. Thank you, everybody. For thank joining you, guys. Us. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Thank you, Rob and Torsten.